Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's uh, MNR. And we've, we've got a fabulous presentation from you from uh, Ken Witherly. You, you'll have read uh, Ken's uh, CV uh, as you signed up. Um, so Ken is talking to us today about something um, really important, which is how we as geophysicists can understand what, what mining companies want in terms of imaging, particularly copper porphyries. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we have an event uh, co-hosted uh, with uh, BC Geophysical Society, and it's, depending on your time zone, it's going to be afternoon, evenings here in uh, the Americas, or mornings in Asia and uh, Australasia and the middle of the night, I'm afraid, for those of you in, uh, in Europe. And then in a week's time, we have the last uh, m and before our Christmas break, and that's uh, how Dong will be presenting to us on uh, SignPro. Uh, just a, a reminder to you all that uh, <clears throat> go on our webpage, the m and webpage, you'll find registration links and you'll find uh, video links and presentations of previous webinars. And then just a, a reminder to you all, this is a Zoom webinar, not, not a Zoom uh, meeting. And so as attendees, you have uh, three functions. One is chat. You can actually uh, chat to either the panelists or to all attendees, but please make the chats relevant. You can raise your hand. And if that's, if you want to towards the end, when the Q&A session starts, if you want to actually speak verbally, raise your hand and I'll, either Max Morkamp, who is, who is uh, co-hosting this with me, uh, or I will, will make you, uh, um, you know, give you audio and video uh, capabilities. And then there's a Q&A and there's a Q&A box. You can see this Q&A and you can write uh, Q&A in there and, and Ken may answer those on the fly or he may wait to the end. Okay, I'll stop sharing now and invite uh, Ken to share your screen and uh, take it away. Okay. Um, is um, you seeing my screen, Alan? Uh, not yet, Ken. Okay. Let's, um... Oh, There's, wait a second. No, the active one is here. Okay, uh, share screen. Ah. I think you you have to share when you when you're sharing screen, Ken, you can pick which app to share. And at the moment you're sharing uh, your uh, Google. Ah, 10 four. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. so we will share this one. Ah, there you are. There you are. Alrighty. And audio is acceptable. Yep. Yep. Very good, Ken. We can hear. All right. Um, I will put it on view mode. Everybody, welcome. Um, what I'm going to present for me this morning, for you, whatever <clears throat> time zone you're sitting in, is a is a work in progress. Um, one of the things uh, a consulting group like ours has are resources that, as we well know, don't always get fully occupied uh, with commercial work. But that gives people like us, and certainly myself, the opportunity to exercise curiosity on problems that we encounter quite often in the commercial world through our clients, but don't have the time necessarily to look at them in any 
great amount of detail. Starting about four years ago, um, we were wanting to get better at looking at uh, large uh, electrical data sets, particularly over porphyry systems. Uh, we felt that while things were fairly dormant back in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, <clears throat> the market would change and come around. And so we began looking around for data sets <clears throat> which we could access which would potentially give us some insights in terms of things that we hadn't known about what our processing could uh, show to us. We hadn't learned how to link the geology with the geophysics better. And uh, <clears throat> basically when such time as um, commercial work did start to reappear, we could effectively offer our clients capabilities, which uh, having to develop on the fly would be quite difficult, but when we had the time to uh, think about it and, and uh, work through data sets without the commercial pressures, uh, we could actually uh, spend a fair bit of time at it. And the first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first project that got selected was a porphyry copper deposit up in the Yukon. It was found back in the 1960s. And in the late 2000s, uh, Quantec, did a uh, Titan uh, IPMT survey over this. It's called the Casino Deposit. And we spent um, my team processing the data and myself putting it together. We spent over a year examining what we could get out of that data and found some very interesting things that had not really been um, defined earlier on uh, by the contractor or by the, by the, by the company who had basically at that soon after the survey had gone into hibernation mode as, as the markets collapsed. So the, the talk will start with Casino. I will move through a number of other deposits we've looked at, but it's, an, it's a, what I would say is a linkage between acquisition of data <clears throat> and geophysical and geological models. There's something which Ultimately, as, as uh, geoscientists and geophysicists, we often will have to be custodian of both the models and the surveys that are being done. Um, I think we've all found that geologists, while can be receptive of geophysical results, tend not to get too heavily engaged in actually the model building part of it. When I'm speaking of models, I'm not just talking numerical models. I'm talking the linkages between observational geology, whether it's on the surface, within drill holes, block models, and the geophysical surveys that we have. So in the first shot here, what lies beneath, uh, this is also sort of like uh, honey I shrunk the kids. There's whole worlds out there that are actually very poorly understood in terms of the linkages between geology and geophysics. And I would encourage anybody who's starting to look at this business don't think for a minute that all the big problems have been solved. They haven't, particularly as, as it applies to exploration. There's an enormous amount of work to be done. Some of it got started a long time ago for a variety of reasons. It never really quite got finished, but it doesn't mean you can't pick up and work with some of it. <clears throat> One of the critical things in a project like this is you need people to help you. You can't do it all yourself. Uh, in the commercial world, you tend to have to, because of proprietary issues, you have to be focused on the um, considerations for your client. But for something like a project like this, um, I was able to bring in a whole number of people and share with them various data sets and have discussions with them, commercial contributors, uh, geoscience consultants, uh, as well as uh, internal and external collaborators on the data. And this in effect is my team. And, and I have a great team and I am very appreciative of all of them. It's a combination of, of collaborators and mentors that uh, helped me learn a great deal about the parts of the problem that I didn't know much about, which particularly is in regard to that center column. All of those people are geologists and some of them actually have worked on the projects I was talking about and gave very useful information. Copper, um, as Alan mentioned in the introduction, porphyry coppers is the focus of this. 
Uh, but copper itself is remains a critical mineral. I, I've noticed it's been rebranded as a green mineral uh, because of its uh, application on the energy side of things. Uh, what we see here are the, the major contributors in terms of uh, production on the left-hand side. Uh, on the right, you can see a graph and uh, the world of copper supply is, is falling. We're sitting here, first date is 2017, it goes out to 2035. And this, you know, based on what is actually deposits that are known, uh, not developed, but are known and being mined, uh, the supply is falling and demand is going up. And we know that not all of the ones that actually are available to be developed, for some reasons, will not likely get there some very significant ones. Some of you might have seen the pebble deposit in Alaska seems to on it, be on its uh, final gasp in terms of uh, not going ahead because of environmental problems associated with the fishing in Bristol Bay. So uh, the world will keep asking for us to find new deposits, which for explorers is exactly what we like to hear. And this is uh, topical <clears throat> with companies like PHP, this came out last week. Large increases in, in production need to be made and porphyries are one of the most important sources of new copper. So these deposits remain relevant uh, in terms of exploration focus. And so I think this work is, uh, has even more application than we started working on it four years ago. Now, our, our geological brethren, of course, have been very interested in porphyries for, for a long time. Uh, the serious exploration in the scientific sense for porphyries began after World War II. And uh, what you find, if you look at the literature carefully, is that there was working models for porphyries uh, coming together in the 1950s and the 1960s. But very little of that was documented. Uh, the same actually applies to geophysics, is that uh, many companies went out, most of them in the beginning, American companies, and started to undertake exploration very aggressively, developing geophysical technology as well as geological thinking and applications. And so porphyries had a period where you couldn't really see much in terms of conversation in academic journals or in potentially in conferences. The people were actually out there doing surveys, mapping, and understanding them fairly well. And it wasn't until the early 70s, the first uh, Lowell and Gilbert model was put out, which defined the uh, style of alteration typical around porphyries. Uh, Dick Silito has picked up on that original work. And he's published a couple of different versions of the porphyry model. This one was put out in 2012 and is probably the most recent uh, of the formal porphyry copper geological models. But what you will note, and if you look at the full paper, is that there is nary a reference to geophysics. So in a way, even though geophysics is used extensively in the search for porphyries, it doesn't get embedded into the uh, targeting models because the geological world focuses on the nuances that they understand in terms of the geological world. And so while there's been many, many, many studies on the ge geology of porphyry copper deposits, there are very few places where you see a combination of geophysical and geological information drawn together to try and come up with an actual pragmatic exploration model. Geophysicists haven't done all that much better themselves. When you look at the literature, and as the advances in, in porphyry copper models were, were made in the late 60s and 70s, there were very few articles that really discuss what, how geophysics contributes to porphyry copper exploration. One of the, uh, of course, things is that when you can make observations, but unless we actually do something with them, they're not effective knowledge. This is an example of one of the first IP surveys carried out by Newmont in 1951 in Peru over a deposit called Cajone. And you can see here the outline in green of the deposit and around it, the pyrite alteration halo that now has become part of the, what we understand as the characteristic signature of many porphyries, not all of them. 
But in the in the document this appeared, which is a volume by weight, which summarized all the Newmont research done in the 50s uh, by Arthur Brandt and his team, there's really no mention here of actually mapping alteration around porphyry systems. But we had the information in 1951. Some people were taking advantage of it, but really not doing uh, formalizing it and putting it out into literature that's such that the larger community could actually understand it. EM also came into play early on in porphyry exploration. Here's a profile over the Pima deposit uh, near Tucson, taken in 1951. And geophysics is actually attributed with directly assisting in the finding of this deposit and was actually a fairly significant breakthrough at the time because geophysics was really all quite new. And so the fact that it actually found something undercover impressed a lot of people. The EM part of the story is more of what I'm focusing on uh, with this talk today, uh, but IP certainly has had a very, very ma major role in the um, search for porphyries. And the two are really in a way complementary, but they uh, were both almost orphaned um, about 20 years after the techniques were first developed. And it wasn't really until about 30 years later that the geophysical community and exploration community started to take uh, IP and uh, EM seriously for porphyries. Here's another one from 1975. Um, this is from British Columbia, work that uh, the company I worked for at the time with Utah became BHP um, about 10 years later. They're an excellent example of the copper deposit uh, sitting in the center and the pyrite halos around the, the edges. So we had the observations, but we weren't really articulating it very well. And interestingly, the, the US mining companies and their geophysical staffs, while very, very busy building uh, uh, some incredible IP equipment, very, very seldom actually documented anything or gave talks in journals. And so there was, there was really an absence of discussion uh, in the industry, in academia about what geophysics was able to contribute. And I think ultimately that lack of communication, uh, the industry suffered as a result of it. Ironically, the groups that were most aggressive in promoting the use of geophysics and IP, particularly for porphyries, were Canadians, uh, largely working through the company McFar at the time. And they documented stories of the use of geophysics in the United States, in Canada, in the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, mid 2014, 2015, there was a research project underway um, in CERC supported University of Alberta, um, people like Martin Unsworth and Jeremy Richards were the key, uh, principal investigators. And they began examining um, MT data and other geophysical data over several porphyry systems, epithermal systems in British Columbia. And this illustration is one of the first and only ones that I have been able to find in the literature that actually shows the efforts to bring together the geology, alteration, mineralization with the geophysical responses. And with this diagram, um, Jeremy Richards was actually, I believe, the first to put pen to paper and give us something which we could now say, yes, we're starting to see petrophysics, geology, and survey geophysics being brought together in developing models. Um, took that long, which is pretty impressive. Uh, one of the things, of course, um, across the in this diagram, I think if my mouse is responding, these are erosional levels. So depending where you are in the world uh, and in the time as to when the deposits formed and what its tectonic history was, uh, these can be um, stripped off so that the original um, rock and alteration that you would have with its associated physical properties is then removed. Um, in places like the Philippines, where deposits, active volcanism is still taking place, 
we can actually find these uh, shallow edifices still present. But in much of North America and South America, erosion has taken the systems down quite a bit deeper. So that's the sort of targets that we potentially can look at. These are theoretical, but they were certainly a good first start. And one of the things that this doesn't factor in that came out of our study, starting with Casino, was that we see other things besides more disseminated mineralization that broach onto what we would normally call massive sulfides, which of course has a long history in the search for volcanogenic massive sulfides, where you have high concentrations, high enough concentrations of metallic sulfides to be quite conductive. What we've found is that there are probably a number of situations where these sorts of geological um, entities occur in porphyry systems. They're, they're not totally unexpected in the geological literature, but they're not something which, uh, like a lot of other things on porphyries, they're not that predictable. So if they exist, it's probably because of some unique part of their history. Um, in this study, when I was uh, looking to put this together, this, this second before chapter, which was presented in, uh, to an audience in Australia, September of last year, I came up with the term GAFs, geophysically anomalous features, is there are a range of, of uh, these entities that are found, some of them at depth, some of them mid-level, and some of them at the top of porphyries that uh, generally constitute very conductive discrete bodies uh, that are often strongly mineralized, quite important from an economic perspective, but not really part of any formal, traditionally geological or geophysical model for porphyry cogfer systems. The relationship between uh, porphyry uh, resistivity and weight percent sulfides uh, was documented here. This is work that Kennecott did back in the 70s. It was published in 1983. And there is really not much in the literature that has come out since. So while it's good, I would say most people would probably say as well, it was a good start, but we, we should be able to do quite a bit better. One of the disappointing things in, uh, in British Columbia where there's a lot of porphyry systems, there is very little petrophysical data available to help explorers build and interpret, uh, build models and interpret data. But you can see here that the um, nuance, disseminated mineralization tends to be fairly higher resistivity in the hundreds or thousands. But if you start to see continuous vein systems coming together, these are the red dots, then your resistivities will start to fall. So these, these conductive zones are by and large Think of them as, as vein systems, uh, as opposed to extruded massive sulfides on the ocean floor that a classic VMS is. These are actually heavy, heavy sulfide loads that basically get injected into a network of, of uh, structures around the porphyry. But where in the porphyry they come out uh, is quite variable. These are the deposits that we uh, have looked at, not all equally because we don't have actual data for all of them but we were able to uh, pull apart and examine and consider them in terms of uh, one place and what, did, what can we learn from each one? And then what importantly can we can think about collectively that they're telling us? Uh, we have a couple of other uh, sites that we've identified that we haven't put into the system. Uh, we turned a, a bit of an angle on the last year in terms of what we did with this, but um, quite, Quite an extensive set. Most of them, of course, uh, in the in the Americas, we haven't really had enough information from deposits in in uh, the Western Pacific. Although we do know there's some similarities um, uh, between the ones on the eastern side of the Pacific and and the west. Here here are the deposits uh, located geographically. Uh, Casino was the first one, and then we kind of marched down down to Santa Cecilia in, uh, in Chile and Cotahuasi. So with the casino deposit, we had the sur a Titan survey, as I mentioned, and uh, the, the lines are, of this Titan are in black, and the deposit itself 
Uh, the economic pit outline is shown as that magenta color. And I will, I, will tell, I will tell all of you one of the frustrations in a survey like this. Porphyry systems tend to be very big, um, probably the largest uh, outside of coal deposits, especially one of the largest metallic style deposits that, that we look for. Um, this survey did not really get beyond the uh, deposit limits itself. And so some of the questions about, did we see a, a pyrite halo? Did we see an alteration effect uh, being mapped out by the resistivity and chargeability? No, we probably did not uh, because of the fact that the uh, survey simply was too limited. And this is something which uh, we see fairly routinely is that porphyries get underestimated by, by people, particularly if they're undercover, because you're, you're not really working with a, with a mappable model of how far do you need to get out? So I encourage you, uh, and techniques like you know airborne geophysics and magnetics in particular are far easier to get a breadth of, of, of uh, investigation just because of the nature of the survey. Ground surveys, people tend to hold back a bit and say, well, I'd rather have more data in a small place, but ultimately it's gonna constrain your interpretability of the data. So this was acquired in 2009. Uh, we got the data in 2016 and began processing in 2017 and doing the analysis. Jump to the, jump to the story, to the GAF. Uh, here we have um, a 3D perspective of the chargeability and the reason, uh, here's the copper isosurface. This is largely um, a super gene enrichment system. One of the interesting things uh, about the casino uh, that's common in, in large parts of the Yukon and Alaska, these areas were never glaciated. Even though we think, we think of them as the land of snow and ice, uh, because of the, the way the glaciers formed uh, in the north, you know, and several millions of years ago, there was actually dead zones where no glaciers were formed or moved. And with that, you you have a geology, which basically has all of the original weathering profile, which is most unusual, very, very seldom seen in places like in British Columbia, but is not uncommon in the Yukon. And so we have the preserved uh, oxide zone in the porphyry system at Casino. Hypogene, which is the primary sulfides occur at depth, but they're a much lower grade. And so our chargeability anomalies in the near surface were fairly complex because the weathering process was not uh, uh, uniform through the entire section. We had places where there were fresh sulfides and oxide. And so the, the IP survey, when you looked at the original anomalies was very lumpy in the near surface and was difficult. Uh, and we understand that difficult to interpret because of the irregularity. So we went into that in some detail uh, for, the, for the client in this case. But with the MT data, uh, a conductive zone down around 650 meters, the green blob sitting in the front of the picture, uh, was located along a fault structure. This is the southern side of the deposit. And this has never been tested. Um, drilling didn't go that deep, but this looks like a, a massive sulfide body. It's fairly conductive. Uh, the Titan survey, the IP part of it didn't reach it, but the MT imaged up. In fact, that was the major feature that showed up in that MT survey. And we've presented that to the client. It sits in their corporate presentation uh, on their website. Uh, and we believe they're still scratching their head. The idea being you may actually have uh, something of significant grade. It'll have to be an underground mine, but it could uh, provide an important co-contributor to the operating mine here with a higher grade uh, mineralization potential, but it has to be drilled. We know that, we'll see what happens. The Morrison deposit, subject of um, Miranda found it back in the 60s. This is in central British Columbia. Um, a ZTEM survey was carried out over the deposit by Geotech about 10 years ago. And then this area was subject of a research program. The universe, I mentioned the University of Alberta with support from NSERC, several industrial partners. And um, Martin Unsworth and his team went in there and performed a series of MT traverses 
which were then used to have a, a joint model between the ZTIM and the, and the MT. These are shots from uh, one of their last papers, and we've got sections here showing the upper right, or sorry, left, the Morrison deposit where it actually sits. It's fairly resistive based on the ZTIM alone. The MT, though, with its greater depth of investigation, is actually starting to see a feature at significant depth. Here's, uh, uh, these are in kilometers. So this is down several kilometers. We see a very conductive zone labeled C3. And then in the joint inversion, this sort of blossoms out. So in this particular case, this is, this is defined as the GAF, something very conductive at depth that doesn't really, in the classic geological model, doesn't really belong there. This should all be down into more intrusive rock, probably you know, expected to be high resistivity. Um, but something unusual is there, which of course has not been tested itself. A corroboration of this, which isn't shown in this particular section is that the ZTEM actually maps out uh, just to the right of this section. There's actually a very conductive zone that shows up in the ZTEM, it's a breccia zone that has been interpreted by a ge uh, geologist as being uplifted part of the bottom of the Morrison deposit. And that gives us some, some potential indication that this conductive zone is actually a piece of it has been brought up to the near surface. What's interesting from the economics perspective is that uh, breccia zone is actually about three times the grade of the porphyry itself. So if more material were available, unfortunately the depth is a little prohibitive, uh, we may actually have some significant mineralization here that hasn't been encountered yet but is expressing itself as being this conductive body. Bingham, one of the largest porphyries in North America, uh, sits um, just west of Salt Lake City, um, somewhat isolated um, by itself, but a really, really very significant deposit that seems to just keep going at depth. Rio Tinto has done an incredible job of acquiring detailed magneto magnetotelluric results over the deposit, including in the pit, which often is, uh, you have to be very careful going into mining pits. The truck drivers don't really look where they're going sometimes. Um, here's a snapshot uh, of the MT results. The outline of the pit is there. The mineralized quartz monzonite is the uh, white outline here. Uh, there's one conductive, conductive feature they found uh, several years ago um, east of the deposit. At the main deposit, you can see this very large MT zone um, sitting at depth. There's a two kilometer scale bar. On section, we have, I labeled it the GAF, this big conductive zone coming down. There's the open pit. There, there's the porphyry system. So, at depth underneath the Bingham deposit, we have this strong conductor. There's the one the other one to the east here, this strong conductor. And this one has actually been tested, even though it's down a kilometer and a half. There are three drill holes that come down and test this directly. And uh, I had an interesting conversation with, with uh, my colleague, um, David Hinks about uh, what this was, and um, uh, it's something significant, but Rio Tinto at this point is a little reluctant to give us any specific information, but it exists in the, in the data, it exists in the model, and it's been corroborated by drilling. So not just porphyry, not disseminated, something really significant is going on there. Resolution is another one held by uh, Rio Tinto and BHP. That's in uh, Southern Arizona. Here's a um, depth scale. Here's a kilometer, half a kilometer, one kilometer down. And here you have, these are overlying unmineralized rocks. Um, one, one of them is somewhat conductive. The other is fairly resistive. Here's the outline of the uh, copper shell sitting here. Uh, down quite deep, it's very, very warm. Here's the intrusive, probably associated creating that deposit sitting here. So it's a stock work sitting above the actual porphyry. Here's MT results acquired in 2006. 
the geology sitting here. Here's the uh, copper deposit, uh, MT unconstrained uh, shown here. Uh, this is conductive geology. It's not mineralization. But when you do a constrained model, you basically can see this feature here, which is very closely related to the mineralization, very conductive zone being separated here. And then you have the resistive material here. This is a, a, a gaff here. With resolution, you have the feature on the top. Uh, at Bingham, you seem to have this conductive zone at the bottom. So this is why I mentioned earlier, we don't really know where these are going to appear, but if they are present, uh, they certainly stand out uh, with techniques like magnetotellurics. Here's another model of the resolution results uh, from a ZTEM survey. Um, we can see the kind of, here's the outline of the copper zone here, and we can see Conductivity features, this would be the overlying material, and these would be probably coming from the actual mineralization. Coyoasi in Chile, um, located back in the 1960s. Uh, Eugenia is a satellite deposit sitting here, and here's Rosario. Both have been mined. Uh, Quebrada Blanca, which is controlled by tech, uh, sits off. Uh, right, well, I haven't circled it, but they're, they're sitting right there. That's another. Um, very significant porphyry that um, tech is mining. In this case, we have a, a IP a survey and uh, some early electrical EM work uh, done by Chevron over here at Eugenia. We have um, the first site of ground TEM in Chile, early 1990s, when uh, a gentleman by the name of Randall Nixon uh, took a Geonix EM system out and basically ran over the supergene blanket known at Eugenia and found a conductive layer that stood out very, very strongly. Interestingly, at Rosario, there is a weak supergene blanket, but the conductivity here is actually created by a vein system in the near surface of massive sulfides, very high grades. And this was actually examined as part of a PhD thesis uh, done by a fellow under Alex Becker at Berkeley in the late 1980s. And unfortunately, I, I met this gentleman uh, uh, last year in Berkeley, was giving, giving a talk similar to this. And his, his PhD thesis never actually got extracted and put into like an SEG meeting or was formally uh, exposed to the minerals exploration community. So until I actually talked with him last year, I was totally unaware of this groundwork that had been done, uh, but it made a very helpful contribution. So back to the point, there's a lot of things that we think we solved that really we haven't solved. They're still waiting for people to pull them together, build the models, acquire the data, and link the geology and geophysics. Um, in the mid 2000s, uh, Glencore, Strat at the time, and then Glencore basically carried out a, a ground a TEM survey over Rosario. There's the pit there. Here's a depth slice, uh, 400 meters. And we see this annulus of conductivity at depth underneath the porphyry system. And I mean, you just have to say, what the hell is that? What's causing something like that to show up? Here's a 3D perspective model of it. And there's, uh, the drill, there's enough drilling done over here. You can see the direct relationship between this conductive zone, this annulus. Here's the porphyry system. Um, you know, it, I have to label the whole thing as the gaff. It just doesn't belong there. But interestingly enough, the operators of the mine, when seeing these results, even though the geophysicists involved in the project uh, encouraged them to do downhole EM to try and investigate this further, said, basically um, refuted this uh, and just said, no, we don't want to do it. The other thing of interest, and back to you know, how we share information, the owners of the deposit have never put this in a formal geoscience publication. Uh, I have cajoled them, uh, tried to shame, shame them. Uh, they refused. Where this came from was when a group of investors 
from visiting the, the mine back in 2007, uh, a, a folio uh, about the deposit was put together for these investors. These geophysical images only appear in that folio. Uh, Glencore and, and Anglo have never released in a geoscience context uh, this information. And I, I find that um, challenging when you try and build it, you try to build models. The last one, San Cecilia. Uh, this is another one south of Koyawasi. And uh, Quantec has done quite a bit of work here with both IP and MT. And we see a very conductive zone, again, associated directly with the mineralization. And we see a very, you know, less than 10 ohmmeter, very, very clear. Uh, maybe a bit different than the other ones, but nonetheless shows the part of spectrum of what we're getting here. Finished off with a few IOCGs, Candelaria, Santa Domingo, and Olympic Dam. So here's uh, recent work that Lundin did at Candelaria after they bought it from Phelps Dodge. And they're seeing, there's the pit through here. So it's kind of a classic IOCG. Can always considered an IP target, nothing particularly conductive showed up in the early days of the mining. But when Lundin thought about it and carried out some EM surveys, they started to see very conductive zones um, going to depth that basically mapped high grade mineralization in the system. And I'm pretty sure that Phelps Dodge or Freeport now as they're known, we're not aware of this and might have actually hung on to the property had they had this sort of information that Lundin generated. Uh, but Lundin, um, I guess you could say they, they saw the light and basically did surveys that allowed them to uh, crack this one open, which is, which is wonderful. Another IOCG um, that's held by Capstone, Santa Domingo. Uh, ZTEM and VTEM surveys were carried out over this deposit, which is pretty neat, having both of those and several very strong conductive features generally not considered typical of IOCG systems appear here. Um, and the granddaddy of them all, uh, the Olympic Dam, um, this is, you, you have to pay attention to the scale in this. There's 40 kilometers. Uh, work has been going on here since the 1970s. Uh, the Olympic Dam deposit itself is this little red finger sitting up in here. But this area here is this, conductive zone. Um, sometimes the Aussies are now calling these, the, the, particularly the one recently at Ernest Henry, the fingers of God. Uh, but this huge uh, conductive zone is basically considered to be the, the uh, afterprint. It's sort of like after the Big Bang when the universe was created. This is basically the smoking gun that uh, when all things happened, Basically, this deposit was formed up in here. Acoustically, it's basically a dead zone, very little character in here, but that corresponds to that conductive zone. So they are out there. Um, they occur in different places. As a community, we're not, I don't think, really encouraging our clients to think about this uh, as much as we should. So we put this out there and say, um, there's lots more to be done. Uh, we've seen some pretty interesting stuff, but we're sure there's other examples out there and we'd love to see them. So thanks very much. Well, thank you, Ken. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. You, um, you really gave a fabulous overview of, of what uh, what the problem is and and what we what we need to do if if uh, the if the attendees don't mind I, and if you don't mind can i i'd like to throw in a an overview question and that is with your vast experience of looking at all the uh, mt and em data over copper porphyries you you must have a what you think is the best strategy for exploring these for getting the best EM image, and uh, I wonder whether you subscribe to this mineral systems idea that you do large scale regional survey and then you focus in 
sharper and sharper with better and better resolution as, as you build up your database. Would, would that be your view? Yeah, um, I think you, you can tell by this, the, the scale of the examples. I mean, the first one at Casino was frustrating because of how limited the, the scope of the survey was. Um, so these are really deposit scale examples. But yes, I mean, therein lies probably yet again, another vast amount of uh, unknown unknowns in terms of what, what do we think the signature would be uh, of these systems? I mean, we have, you know, the, the, the back end one was at the Olympic Dam and I have a, I was asked to give a talk in 24, uh, 2014 at the SEG Keystone meeting by John Horonsky, who was, you know, one of the early advocates, um, not the first, that was back in the 1990s. But John and people like Cam McQuaig at the CET were, were um, starting to beat the um, mineral system bandwagon. And John said, would you put something together on the geophysics? And so I went out and I looked at things like the Olympic dams uh, stuff because that had come out about a decade earlier. Part of it was work WMC had done and then part of it BHP. And then, you know, folks at University of Adelaide took over and Graham Heinsohn, you know, did wonderful work and the seismic folks. But there, in the end, that's, that section that I showed, there's a version of it, and uh, I, I didn't know where it came from. I mean, it, it was very difficult to actually get an attribution. And uh, I went back to Horonsky a couple of times and finally got him to fess up that uh, it largely originated inside uh, Western mining. And he pointed me to the gentleman that had actually put a large part of it together. And I contacted them. He, he, he's still active in the business and lives in Perth. And I said, well, wh what did it mean to you? What it, it, what's the significance of this? This looks really impressive. And he said, we went and took that and applied it elsewhere in the Gawler Craton, which is the home of the, you know, the big bathtub that hosts Olympic Dam. And he said, we really didn't find all that many other examples, or, or I think in a way, didn't find any. Now, most quite recently, BHP's found another Olympic Dam style feature. Uh, I think it's about 60 kilometers away from Olympic Dam. So they own it, right? And they, but it yields up its secrets slowly. So with the, with the early knowledge that Western Mining had about the signatures from the magnetotellurics and the seismic, even with that, it was quite a difficult thing, and I and I and I and I think in a way, Alan, what we have is we have observations, but we don't actually have knowledge at this point. In, in many respects, when I say knowledge, you're going in there and seeing stuff often for the first time, and we're saying that's great but we don't know exactly what that is. Um, more work has to be done, I think, in a predictive sense so that we can actually model these things. And um, that, that uh, so yes, I think we need that information, uh, but we have to be prepared that we're not necessarily gonna have a framework to put it in. A, a geological colleague at a, at, a, at a meeting a couple of years ago said something to me quite insightful about back, we were discussing, well, the overall topic was how to make research better or call it the failure of research to deliver results that are practical and, and, and usable, uh, actionable results. Uh, it's Craig, Craig Hart, who, who till recently was head of MDRU. And his comment about background responses in geology, he said, you go away from a mineral deposit and very quickly you will get into uh, geological variations that are simply statistically predictable, but very unpredictable from a forward-looking sense. And you don't know really what those signify. And I think geophysics potentially contains, they're not even false positives. It's almost like fractal information. It's, it's not noise, but we don't really have, uh, I mean, it's like a thousand butterfly and butterfly effect taking place. And we, 
we uh, that's what I found when I looked in 14 at what our state of knowledge was back then. Mike Dentis tried to kick it a bit along a bit further, but um, so in a way we've we've done the cop out um, is that we've gone out and started to get a lot more data. That is good, but we're going to have to spend a, a, some way an equivalent amount of time thinking about it. And just like with this exercise I talk about, huge amount of time is actually necessary to, to stare at stuff and think about it, discuss it with your colleagues and figure out actually what's happening. So I guess it's a qualified yes, you should start at that scale, but I'm not sure we're, we're quite capable of handling it uh, at this point. We've got uh, quite a few questions and Jerry, Jerry Roth has got his hand up to talk. So I'll, I'll just. He, just well, if he needs to, he can leave the room. It's okay, Jerry. No, no. Yeah, Jerry, you can talk. Yes. Hi there. Ken, thanks very much for providing an opportunity for us to gather virtually on a, and we're, when we can't uh, gather actually and uh, keep our neurons reasonably stimulated. So appreciate that. And of course, uh, an excellent topic for us all to uh, reflect on and ponder and with our own uh, uh, variants and experiences. Uh, just uh, hold your uh, hold the phone here for uh, the microphone for a few seconds. Um, one, of course, as you know, I resist the uh, going back to the Club of Rome. Uh, the world has not yet run out of copper, and all one has to do is raise the price by twenty percent and put a few more shovels in Chuki Kamada and uh, the, uh, the, that uh, gap diminishes rapidly. So, uh, but uh, anyway, I look forward to the opportunity to discuss these in, things in person sometime, but something, you know, the, these are all price sensitive uh, aspects. In terms of uh, body of prior uh, compilations of porphyry systems and their geophysical responses, of course, many mining companies that have vanished uh, have various compilations. AMAX had an excellent compilation on every Mali occurrence and deposit in the world. And they, as it developed an interest in copper, it also added uh, quite a few copper deposits uh, that it looked at or got data on. So, and the other thing is that copper model, geological model has sort of branched into about at least five different subvariants that have uh, different geophysical characteristics, as you sort of indicate when you're a plot of resistivity versus sulfide percent and uh, sulfide characteristic. Um, I guess, uh, as I say, I look forward to the opportunity to look at some of your examples in more detail. I do get concerned about when you show in inversions of various geophysical data sets without specifically addressing the uncertainty in those inversions and uh, point to some apparent deep uh, conductivity or features that uh, sort of rest on the quality and nature of that inversion. So just a general caveat there, as you and I know, it's a, an aspect that always bears scrutiny. Um, for instance, Morrison is indeed resistive at near surface so I have no idea what that uh, feature that apparently is, shows up in the deep inversion, the conductive feature, but at least it allows us to speculate. Um, so those are the, uh, and of course, there's the final difficult question we've talked about on occasion. How do you differentiate the uh, porphyry systems of, uh, that are dominant in pyrite and minimal in calcopyrite from those that are have an economic uh, significance. And as you know, various IP researchers and geologists and mineralogists have all wrestled with that. So, uh, but anyway, thanks again for stimulating a, a, a body of uh, field professionals around the world. Thank you, Jerry. I, I don't know if there's a question in there <laughs> for you. <laughs> We, we've got somebody else with a hand up. Is uh, Jeff Warren? I'll just uh, allow allow Jeff to speak. Jeff. Oh uh, yeah, just wanted to say uh, um, absolutely marvelous uh, presentation, Ken. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Oh, okay. 
So there's some questions, Ken. The first one from um, Richard Smith. Can you see the questions there? Um, if you press on the Q and A box, you should see. Ten four. Yeah. Can other people see it, or should I read the question? Uh, everyone should be able to see it if they press on the Q and A box. You can. You should be able to see all the questions that have been made live. Okay. Um. The, um, yeah, I mean, and this gets to part of, of Jerry's observations or concerns. I mean, often we're, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in multiple sources of information, even if each bit of that information has a certain uncertainty and subjectiveness to it, that the weight of evidence, if you can get multiple inputs, uh, yeah, they, they may be all going in tangents together, but uh, and like in the case of Bingham, um, those drill holes were probably a million dollars each. Uh, there were three of them on, on the slide I've seen. And there's probably more. They're planning to mine it, which implies uh, this is, uh, Rio Tinto would not drill that many holes at, to that depth to test groundwater. I don't think they're concerned about an acid mine drainage issue that would be conductive at that depth. So by inference, Richard, it has to be ore and it has to be high grade. And, and one of the things that you, you have to, you know, say you keep in mind, but Rio Tinto also has resolution, which is a totally undeveloped, very high grade, highest grade porphyry in North America, I believe but also subject to very high temperatures. Uh, and clearly there's no, there's no, but there the sulfides are on top. They're not at the bottom, okay? So the, the depth, say at resolution, uh, is largely because of cover, cover rocks. Um, because resolution would have been found 40 years ago had those cover rocks not been present because of just the Gaussian that would have developed as many other Porphyries um, have the Gaussian that would have developed there. So I would say no. I think Rio Tinto is um, um, hits. Hinks actually gave me about three or four things that he said could be the source, and I I, I viewed that as as a uh, Rio Tinto gamemanship that he, he he just didn't feel comfortable talking about what was the. Um, um, even for them, a forward-looking statement. So no, I don't think you, a company wouldn't spend that much. They might have drilled one hole, but three, and then the plans to mine are clearly indicating there's extensions, not only at depth, but they're economically more significant than the porphyry in the pit itself. You're not gonna be going down and chasing uh, at a kilometer and a half, you're not going to be going down and chasing 0.4 copper. No way. It's just not economic. Um, okay, then there's three questions from Syed, more of a technical yeah. nature. Hi, uh, Lowland Gilbert. So the Lowland Gilbert was the, with, with this is the seminal publication um, on the porphyry model based on work largely that Dave Lowell did uh, at San Manuel and Kalamazoo, which is a split system, but it allowed him to uh, see basically the whole system telescoped out. Um, what I found interesting was that that paper came out in 1970, but the knowledge behind it was actually fairly commonly distributed amongst the companies on a working basis 15 years earlier. And that included the geophysics. There's actually informal and I guess historically proprietary work. And Jerry mentioned some work that AMAX did. Many of the companies had, had excellent research groups, but other than people leaving and, and carrying that information with them, 
very, very little of it ever saw the light of day from the point of view of being shared with industry or the rest of industry. So everybody had to invent the wheel themselves. It was, it was actually pr pretty, pretty darn inefficient. So um, figures are widely smooth. Okay. Contrary corner. Who is more accurate? Right. Um, one of the things that actually, in regards to that original Lowell and Gilbert, is uh, I mean, it was actually kind of funny because the the um, I thought it was funny. Geologists are arguing, right? Uh, the Canadians revolted, and they said our porphyries are different. <laughs> and I think this is probably a vestige of that. And what happened was Lowell and Gilbert actually several years later published a, a second version of their porphyry copper model that took into account the variations that were observed in the porphyry systems in, in the Northern Cordillera, British Columbia, Alaska, the Yukon. So I think uh, they, they caught up with the news, but they, I mean, Basically, the original paper was not a thematic look at all porphyries. It was a really detailed look at one porphyry system. And so uh, the generalities that they assumed uh, couldn't really stand the test of time when you went to look at the, the normal variations out there that, that actually occur. And so uh, I would say, you know, in, in a, in, in, in the, world of the big tent we like to think we live in, all opinions are, are, are accurate, but they need to be calibrated in terms of the local environment. And I think that's, that's helpful. I mean, what we really would like, and it gets back to Alan's comment about mineral systems, how um, general can we make these arguments and discussions and, and designing exploration strategies? How robust are our models? And how much of the time do we actually you know, need to say, well, it could be on the top, it could be on the bottom, it could be on the side, da -da. and that's with the gaffs, that it, it's, the rascals are bounce up and down. And, and I think what I've done in, with geological audiences is that I've been putting questions to geologists to say, why do you think these things, these features are, are there? And is there any way of predicting whether they're there? Because they have a significant impact, particularly in brownfields exploration is to go in and look for things at depth that really wouldn't have got people's attention. So I don't think accuracy, is, the last word you use is necessarily what we want. We want robustness and, and usability of the model. Um, it's not required that we, we understand it to, uh, we're not open heart surgeons. We don't need to know things in great detail. We just need enough to make the recommendation that we're comfortable with to take the project to the next step. Um, I think on the one in Casino uh, was the depth of investigation that the IP technique, the chargeability resistivity, simply the signal to noise and what you could recover uh, really topped out um, probably around 300, uh, 300, 350 meters, whereas MT, um, was able to give us uh, information down, you know, well past that. And that's where that gaff sits. So it wasn't, um, we haven't actually done any um, forward modeling to try and um, ascertain whether that, that guess is correct. That would be one thing that could be helpful is, is um, you know, ascribe some physical properties, including chargeability to, to, to the body we defined with the MT and push it up into the um, uh, IP world and see if we, we can see it. Um, casino, there was no um, ZTEM, that was Morrison. Okay. Yeah, and then Sergio has got four four questions in one. 
Uh, well, just, uh, one's yeah. not a question. It's a, it's yeah. a statement. Yeah. Um, the second one's a statement. Yeah. The third one's an observation. I mean, the original papers are there mm -hmm. and the authors are all still, well, other than Jeremy Richards, unfortunately, still available. And the fourth one's a statement. So thanks for sharing that, Sergio. Um, and yeah. Okay. Moving Larger on. discussion at some point, like Jerry said. Yeah. Uh, Fernando asks about airborne IP. Well, the, the I, my knowledge is not necessarily up to date or that extensive, uh, but there is a gentleman who lives in Melbourne who's looked at this. Um, uh, professor Jim McNay, or used to be professor at RMIT, he's now consulting independently. Jim has had a um, an interest, a fascination with airborne IP for some time, and and I believe has had some um, technological activities in that area. Um, there's another. There's another. Uh, there's another individual. And I know less about what he's doing, who has looked at this topic. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't know of any actual system that's being targeted to be either developed for proprietary or commercial use in that front. But there's discussion out there. Uh, Okay, uh, Mohammed, I would. I'm a. Um, I'm a big fan of test surveys. Um, we often don't know enough about the geology to be too prescriptive about what technique might work, and so if you have a an opportunity to examine um, with a couple of you know time domain MT, uh, CSA MT, um, each one has some technological and maybe logistical advantages uh, for the particular problem. W one of the things that um, we say certainly encountered at resolution, and we know that the Rio Tinto folks would have had to deal with around, you know, mines is cultural response. Um, some of the techniques we'd love to use uh, just really get hammered by power line Effects and such, and and so you're you're forced down to use approaches that aren't necessarily optimum. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, We've a, a, a colleague and one of one of my collaborators, Daniel Sattel, did an interesting study on a ZTEM survey over enormously um, magnetic mafic body in in Alaska. Um, I can point that out to people. And he was, I mean, when that anomaly was found. Uh, it was that by then it was called humble oil, but which is now we're no, we know it as Exxon Mobil. Um, when that anomaly was found in the 1950s, I believe it was the strongest magnetic anomaly ever, ever located in a, in a geophysical survey, something like 35,000 nanoteslas. And this seemed to be a perfect place uh, to examine the effects of susceptibility and connectivity and their interaction. And um, this is work that Daniel did about five, six years ago. And my impression was 
from that that there there were no first order effects. Um, so we weren't seeing like we do with the the um, uh, oh the normal frequency domain systems the industry has access to the DIGIM, the, the resolve where there's strong effects of magnetic susceptibility overprint onto the in-phase data and have to be taken out. In fact, it's useful information. Uh, so they should be taken out and, and quantified and, and interpreted just as the conductivity is. Um, but yeah, with the, with the ZTEM system, it, it didn't seem to be uh, uh, a big issue, but I'm not, most of the cases, I mean, of the examples I'm showing, we. We don't really have access to primary original data to to examine and ask these questions, um, so they remain potentially good questions. Uh, and to me, it's always one you know one person's noise is another person's signal, and and things that we feel we have to remove, like remnants. Uh, there are people that really want to see remnants and and quantify it and and help build those geological models that. Will help us understand the Earth so much the better. Okay, Dave Watterson. That's that's getting out of my my uh, area of even making a rough comment about. Is there any hope in large scale? Tricky, I guess. I know of some work on the dielectric side of things and piezoelectric. We supported a bunch of um, two students at UBC. They were the last um, PhD students of uh, Don Russell. It ended up being very difficult to get measurable results. Exxon did a lot of work or humble on dielectric. It's tough, but I'm not sure I'm answering the question particularly well. Uh, well, I think the thing is that that what the examples I've shown is that the MT isn't necessarily responding to the entire system. Uh, it could be, it most likely is gonna to respond to the part of it that's anomalous from a sulfide content. And, but by no means, I mean, like that example at Koyawasi, if you had gone in and, and you know, mapped that, that big conductive annulus at depth, uh, you wouldn't have actually seen the porphyry. <laughs> You would have seen uh, that other feature, you know, much deeper. And so, your multiphysics is probably important from the point of view of when I say multiphysics, getting a variety of techniques, and then you know, call it co-integrating, interpreting, playing them off against each other. Uh, and yes, I mean, I haven't made a big point of it. Sergio brought it up. The critical role of petrophysics to help provide a Rosetta Stone to explain these. We just, we just uh, don't have enough of that sort of information uh, often to, to keep us on the right track. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it deserves to be considered a special, was it? Okay, Gary. Yeah, I'm. Um, um, I, I guess it's it's as explorers, our job is to figure out enough about the geology and the science of it to then make practical recommendations that allow you know whoever is employing us to to take the project to the next stage, and having having it unique. If you can understand that uniqueness and take play it to your advantage, you'll probably be the more successful explorer. Um, I think this is always the case. Our curiosity, our innovation, uh, our, we just can't do it from a recipe book. 
This is not Betty Crocker, right? Never has been. So go for it. Sorry, Ken, if I might just jump in and, and address Makoye Didas's question about uh, MT in active mining areas. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I touched on part of that about the, the cultural aspects. Yeah. You've got challenges there. Uh, they're not necessarily insurmountable. I mean, large part of the, that MT work that Rio Tinto did would have all been done under, uh, you know, it's an operating mine. They didn't, they didn't shut it down. They didn't take the cables down. So um, it is doable, but there's probably, and you would probably have more direct experience, Alan, with, you know, are your costs gonna double? I don't know, take longer to sample? I just want to mention um, that I tried to make empty measurements down a mine at the at the base of a mine in Newfoundland, and I got the company to shut off all their 60 hertz, even the safety stuff, and the safety guys were not happy about that. But still, there was enough 60 hertz around that we couldn't get decent measurements. We got crap. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean we we we, we got a. a Back in the late 70s, we got one of the, uh, probably the first Zong equipment up in Canada. And we were looking at a nickel deposit south of Timmins and, and uh, all those massive sulfides acted like a wonderful antenna. There were power lines like 10 kilometers away to the west of us. And um, the massive sulfide just picked it up and we, we were challenged seriously challenged by the, the cultural noise from, from that distance. Okay, Jerry, we've done it. Dennis has got, okay. uh, Dennis is asking about deep uh, TEM. Right. Um, well, the, the Koyawasi example is, is a, a, a pretty good, uh, example of that. I don't know that, well, they haven't shared whether M any MT was done at Koyawasi or Yuhina. I know um, the, the time domain at Yuhina to the east was, was relatively bread and butter stock standard, you know, geonics in the day, um, not, not particularly deep. What is your, as opposed to what are normally strong to MT? Well, you know, at, at Casino, the anomaly wasn't particularly broad. It was fairly, fairly compact, um, fairly tight. Um, and geologically in an interesting area, the, 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 the company has actually found uh, that feature sits along a major roughly east-west structure at depth. And it's got, it's very anomalous geochemically. So they are actually, over time, they're, they're building up a case that that may, you know, have, I, I've told them, I said, they should go in and do a, a ground TEM survey just to try and sharpen it up uh, before drilling, because it's going to be, it's not going to be cheap. You're going to look at quarter, half million dollars probably to test that. I could do better on your your question, Dennis, but I probably need to think about it a bit more. Um, yes, yes, Stephen, they have. I'm sure they have done that. Sharing has been their problem. I mean, you know, putting this out into uh, uh, a public forum, but they are aware of this and there is some, um, some, some of that has come out um, as, as, as has similar information from resolution, probably a bit less. Salt basins, ah, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Passive seismic. <laughs> I, I think the the conductivity world will be very challenged with those sorts of uh, those sorts of uh, resistivity conductivities. Um, or I guess you know, am I Alan? Am I being too glib by saying just keep dropping your frequency with the MT and you'll finally get there? Um, 
Yeah, the problem when you come out of a very large conductor like that is that your uh, skin depth explodes suddenly and you've got no resolution of anything below a basin. Uh, you know, they're talking about 100 Siemens per meter <laughs> resistivities. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Benjamin, Ben, I mean, uh, good, po uh, and good points. Um, our, um, putting the, you know, in gen and as a general statement, putting the geological components of the story together as much as you have is really, really important. Um, I think the, the very first example, which wasn't part of our study, but it was kind of an intro slide from, from Pima, that is a, that is a, a um, recognized as a SCARN. And then um, some of the IOCG stuff probably is, is also such. Um, it's less clear of, I mean, those, the, you know there are there are some classes of porphyries that come up into into sedimentary rocks, but the the majority uh, they're all volcanic piles. You know, going from andesite to felsitic, and then intrusive rocks. There's there's very little carbonate present in, in not all, but a number of them. But um, yeah, I mean, like at Bingham, trying to find a a really good geological section we could geolocate. Given we don't even have the data uh, to plot up, we're we're kind of at a disadvantage, and so um, I think it's we tried. To, I tried to make the point that, that there's enough there's enough going on that it warrants more attention than it's been given, but it's it's this isn't a um, you know idiot's guides to porphyry exploration. This is like there's a lot more work. Should be done academically, um, commercially, and be aware. And it isn't just three D modeling of data. It's thinking about stuff like you and others have raised. What about the geology and Sergio? It's just it's so critical that we we have that, and it's just often not um, it's not available, or people don't spend the time to put it together. Fernando, yeah, uh, we're we're making regular use um, of that commercial product, and um, uh, from from what we had historically, um, we we definitely think it's an improvement. Yep. Great. Well, that's all the questions. Well done, Ken, and absolutely. Uh, again, thank you from. We had uh, 80 people attending, listening to you, and uh, not many have left. Everyone's wrapped <laughs> attention. So I'd like to thank you again from everybody, and uh, thank everybody for uh, attending. And uh, just a, just a quick reminder: um, I'll get the screen back from you. Okay, just just a bit um, of reminder, everybody, that tomorrow uh, or Friday morning we have another. Uh, special event together with the British Columbia Geological Survey. And so that's a, an unusual time, I guess, 30 minutes past midnight UT. So you have to work out what that is in your time zone. And then next week we have the final uh, MNR of this, uh, of this month. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming, being here. Seriously, I'd like to thank Ken for absolutely wonderful webinar and this will this will be available on the web within about an hour or so thank Bye you everybody. alan bye 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 everyone